Welcome to the video for chapter 13. Today we're going to talk about magnetic forces. And if it weren't for today's uh, discussion of magnetic forces, we wouldn't really care about magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are really only important in that they impact the things around them. And these, this, of course, this impact is caused by forces. So today we're going to talk about what happens when you have a single charged particle moving through a magnetic field. We're also going to see what happens when there's a current carrying conductor that moves particles through that same field. And then we're going to wrap up our discussion by looking at a loop of current. What happens when there is a, a loop of current that's moving through a magnetic field? We'll see that that's actually going to allow us to find the foundation of, of, of DC motors, of electric motors motors. So uh, today's uh, historical perspective is Professor Lorentz. Uh, we're going to see that there is a special force named after him and uh, he was a, a physicist in the early 1900s, won the Nobel, uh, shared the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics in 1902. So let's talk a little bit about the magnetic force on a charged particle. We're going to see that there is a, a, that if we have a magnetic flux density, so we've already spoken about magnetic flux density uh, B, uh, if there is a magnetic flux density in the vicinity of a current density J, uh, then, then the question is, what does the magnetic flux density do exactly? We know, given J, we can now calculate B, but the question is, what, what, what does B do? Well, the interesting thing is that if there is another charged particle moving near that magnetic flux density, then a force is applied to that charged particle. So you can see that it is simply the, the cross product of V crossed with B, the velocity of the particle crossed with the magnetic flux density. Of course, that's multiplied by the charge on the particle. So as that charge becomes larger, the, the force will become larger as well. But it's also important to remember that there can be a sign on that, on that charge. So that if that sign is positive, then we would end up with V cross B. If the sign is negative, we would end up with negative V cross B. And that's really illustrated in, in, this, in this figure 13.1. Uh, Again, it's really hard to represent this in, in the in, in two-dimensional uh, picture here, but you place your, your, your fingers in the direction of V, which is the first uh, element that we're, that we're doing the cross product of. Then you curl them in the direction of B, which is pointing downward. And when you do that and stick your thumb out, it will tend to go in the direction of, uh, of F for Q greater than zero. But of course, if, if Q is less than zero, we would reverse the direction of that and we would see that it would be going in the negative A sub X direction. So V crossed B using the right hand rule will tell us the direction of the force. And then if the charge is negative, we would have to flip the direction of that force. So what is the force on a charge of negative 0.1 coulombs moving with a velocity of 50 A sub Y meters per second passing through a magnetic field of 1.5 a sub z tesla. So we know that the, the magnetic force F sub magnetic is equal to Q times V cross B. And in this case, the Q is going to be negative 0.1 coulombs multiplied by V, which is 50 a sub y. Uh, again, we'll use the common units, so I won't need to carry the units through and everything, crossed with 1.5 a sub z. Now if I go back up to the to figure 13.1, what is a sub y crossed with a sub z? Well, let me erase these original arrows here. a sub y, so you put your hand in the direction, point your fingers in the direction of a sub y, curl them in the direction of a sub z, and again your thumb is going to stick out in the direction of a sub x. So this is going to be, uh, this cross product will end up being a sub x. Uh, but don't forget the negative sign here. So this ends up being negative, and if you multiply those three uh, numbers together, you get negative 7.5 newtons in the a sub x direction. So the 7.5 came from 0.1 times 50 times 1.5. The a sub x came from a sub y crossed with a sub z, and the negative sign came from the negative uh, 0 0.1 coulombs. So there really isn't a whole lot more to share with you about magnetic forces other than uh, the fact that, don't forget, we also have electric forces. So we, we have already uh, seen, not exactly in this form, but very similarly, we've seen that the electric force is Q times E, the electric field. The way that we really introduced this before was to define E to be F divided by Q. So that's why this isn't really a, a copy of a, an earlier equation. So what we can do is we can combine the equation 13.1 and equation 13.2, and we get uh, we get 13.3. 
And this is the combination of the electric field and the magnetic field, and this is known as the Lorentz force. Lorentz force includes both, both uh, the effect of the, uh, the electric field and of the magnetic field. And so we can, you might say, well, uh, Professor Lorentz, you didn't really do that much. You really just combined together the work that two other people had done. And it's true, but, but there are lots of other things that he did that, that caused them to uh, name this equation in his honor. So what is the Lorentz force? Again, remember the total electric and magnetic force that is uh, on the particle from example 13.1 if there is also an electric field of 100 A sub X volt per meters present. So the, the Lorentz force, as we just saw, is equal to Q times E plus V crossed with B. <clears throat> and so the Q is still the same as it was, negative 0.1 Coulombs. Again, don't need to carry everything through all the units because they're all the standard SI units. Uh, and then the electric field is 100 A sub X volts per meter or newtons per coulomb uh, plus 50 A sub Y uh, crossed with 1.5 A sub Z. Uh, so this will be negative 0.1 times 100 A sub X and as we just saw in the previous example, uh, a sub y crossed with a sub z gives a sub x. 50 times 1.5 gives 75. So this is 75 a sub x. And when we do this multiplication, the addition and then the multiplication, we get negative 17.5 newtons in the a sub x direction. So in this one case, the electric field and the magnetic field are pointing in the same direction. They reinforce each other. In other cases, they could cancel each other out. You could have something where the electric field was perfectly balanced with the magnetic field uh, and the magnetic force. Uh, or you could have a case where they would be perpendicular to each other, where one would be causing, say, rotation and the other one could be causing acceleration or deceleration. Well, it's interesting, if we go back now to the case where there really isn't an electric field, if there's only a magnetic field, remember what we saw earlier, which is that F of the magnetic field is, is equal to Q times V cross B. Remembering that the cross product is always perpendicular to both of the elements that you're taking the cross product of. That means that the force will always be perpendicular to the magnetic field, but it is also perpendicular to the velocity. And any system where the force is perpendicular to the velocity, that's going to describe circular motion. So as you can see here, if we find that the force is perpendicular to the velocity, then that force is going to be uh, pointing toward the center of a circle, and this will cause centripetal acceleration, and that will cause rotational motion. <clears throat> so anytime that you have, and I've, I've shown three magnetic fields here, that's really the, the three Bs here. That's really just to show that there's a constant uh, magnetic field across this entire region. So if you have a velocity and then the force is perpendicular to that velocity, it's going to create circular motion. Just as if you're swinging a rope over your head, the, the force on the rope is always pulling the object toward the center of the circle. Uh, it's never accelerating or decelerating it along the, along the circumference of the circle. It's accelerating or decelerating it toward the center of the circle. So the question that you might naturally ask is, what is this radius, which is typically represented by the Greek letter rho? How big is this circle? How big is the, the rotation that we're going to be seeing here? And the answer is, it depends. Of course, the answer is always, it depends. Let's talk a little bit about this, uh, about this rotation. We know uh, that this, well, we know that there'll be a rotation. It's known as the gyro radius, or sometimes known as the Larmor radius. And so we'll, we'll call it the gyro radius in, in this uh, discussion. It can be calculated really from things that we already know. You may have forgotten a couple of these things, but, but they're things that you have already seen. We know that the, magnetic, the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration necessary for a particle of mass m to rotate with a velocity of v at a radius of rho is uh, m v squared divided by rho. That's the thing you might have forgotten. But this is the centripetal acceleration necessary for this particle to stay on that circular loop. So then the question is, uh, how big would the radius need to be? Because we know, if I flip back up here, remember that the magnetic, the magnetic force is Q times V times B. If we don't worry about the direction, we don't even need to say cross product or vectors. If we're just worried about the magnitude, it's just QVB. So QVB is the force. But we also know that mv squared over rho is the force. So we can set those two equal to each other in equation 13.5.
And then we can solve equation 13.5 for the radius rho. Uh, and what we'll find, well, this v will cancel with half of that v squared. And everything is just linear. It's just mv over qb. So we actually have an equation to allow us to calculate this gyro radius. So the question is, we have an electron accelerated through a voltage of 0.1 volts and then subject to a magnetic field of 0.01 tesla. Calculate the gyro radius. Okay, so let's, let's draw a picture because this, this phrase accelerated through a voltage of 0.1 volts may or may not be clear to you. What I want you to picture is that we've got a tube here or think of it as like a tunnel. And electrons kind of go in, they just kind of wander in one side of it. But we have a 0.1 volt difference here. And that 0.1 volt difference is kind of like a, it's kind of like a roller coaster. You know, if we were to draw this as an energy band, they, are, they would be going down like this. And so, of course, uh, that, is, that means that we're going to see acceleration. And so the electrons that just kind of randomly wander into the left end of this tube come out of the right end of the tube with a, with a relatively high velocity. So as those electrons leave the right end of the tube, now they've got a velocity, and we're going to send them into a region of magnetic flux density. And so as they enter that magnetic flux density, they're going to have a velocity, and we know that there's going to be a radius, rho. We know that there's going to be a magnetic field, uh, and we know that, of course, the electrons have a mass. Therefore, we know everything that we need to know about how uh, big that radius is going to be. So we know that the energy that is, uh, that is gained by the particle as it's going through that 0.1 volt uh, roller coaster region is going to be Q times delta V. After all, that's the definition of voltage, is that it is, it is the, uh, the um, energy. I probably shouldn't call that E, because we use that for ele electric field. I'll call it W. W is the energy, uh, and it's work per energy per unit uh, charge is the voltage. So uh, the, the, the voltage multiplied by the charge is going to give us the energy. Another way of representing that energy is that it's all going to be uh, kinetic energy, so it's going to be 1 half mv squared where V is the velocity. So delta V is the voltage, V is the velocity. So I could then solve this equation to figure out what is the velocity. So the velocity is going to be the square root of 2 Q delta V divided by M. So I know Q, that's fixed for, for an electron. I know delta V, it's 0.1 volts for this problem. I know M, that's fixed for an electron. I have enough information to solve for the velocity. So let's go ahead and do that. This is going to be the square root of 2 times the charge on an electron, 1.602 times 10 to the 19th coulombs, multiplied by delta V, which in this case is 0.1 volts, divided by the mass of an electron, which actually hasn't come up so far in this class, but it is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31st coulombs, or, uh, uh, kilograms. So this velocity works out to be 2.97 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. It's a very large velocity. That, that electron is moving very fast. Think of this as sort of like a rifle that is shooting those, those electrons out at a relatively high velocity. Of course, we weren't asked for the velocity. We were asked for the gyro radius. And the gyro radius rho is equal to mv divided by qb. And so we know the, the mass, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31st kilograms multiplied by the velocity, 2.97 times 10 to the fifth, uh, don't need the units, meters per second, divided by Q, which is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, and then the magnetic uh, field is 0 0.01, 0 0.01 Tesla. And when we multiply all of that out, we find that it is 1.69 times 10 to the minus fourth, 10 to the minus fourth, meters, which is about 0 0.17 millimeters. So think of a millimeter as the thickness of a dime. We're at about 17% of the thickness of a dime. That is a very tiny rotation. You can imagine that unless you viewed this with a microscope, it would be very hard to even see that those electrons were rotating. So uh, that's one of the reasons why this, this uh, um, phenomenon took some time for us to discover. But then the question is, what happens if we shoot a different particle through the same exact system? What would happen then? So we're going to repeat that particle. We're going to repeat that example. That should be repeat example 13.3. If the particle is uh, a singly ionized potassium atom, which is to say that it has 19 protons, 20 neutrons, and 18 electrons. 
Well, we're going to neglect the mass of the electrons because compared to the mass of a proton or a neutron, the mass of an electron is trivial. So let's find what is the mass of this particle, uh, and I'll, I'll call this m sub k, k for potassium there. m sub k is going to be 39, so that is to say 19 protons and 20 neutrons. And at three significant figures, the mass of a proton and the mass of a neutron are equal to each other. So that is 39 times 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms, which works out to be 6.51 times 10 to the minus 26th kilograms. So we now have a much larger particle. This is a particle that is uh, 10 to the fifth larger, 10 to the fifth more massive. Uh, so we're talking about something that's 100,000 times more massive than the, than the particle we were just considering. So let's see what happens to the velocity. Um, the velocity is going to still be the square root of 2 times the charge. Well, notice that this has 19 protons and 18 electrons. So because it is singly ionized, that means that this, this particle actually still has the same exact charge as a single electron. Um, it's, going to, it's going to be positive, so actually the rotation will occur in the opposite direction. So whereas before, when, uh, as when we drew the picture before, uh, the system uh, shot the particle out and it rotated downward, here, when we shoot the particle out, so when we shoot the particle out, it's actually going to rotate upward. Uh, and the question is, what is going to be the radius of, of that upward uh, rotation? So this is 2 times 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th, multiplied by 0 0.1, that's the voltage, divided by the mass, which is 6.51 times 10 to the minus 26th. And this works out to be 701 meters per second. So because this particle is so much larger, it is going to exit that tunnel with a much lower velocity. Uh, and so we're going to see what, what, what happens with that lower velocity. Well, we know that rho is equal to mv divided by qb, which is going to be 6.51 times 10 to the minus 26th times 701 divided by 1.6, 1.6, 0, 0.2 times 10 to the minus 19th multiplied by 0 0.01, the magnitude of the magnetic field. This works out to be 2.85 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, which is about, uh, it is, which is 2.85 centimeters, which is about one inch. That, that about is within about 10 to 15 percent, just to give you a picture of sort of what the thickness of, or the radius of that rotation is going to be. So having a much larger particle, uh, sort of like turning a battleship or turning, a, turning a, uh, uh, an aircraft carrier, they take longer to turn the larger vehicle. And in the same way, it takes longer, it takes a, a larger rotation uh, for us to rotate the, uh, the, the larger particle. <clears throat> Now, one final consequence of the fact that the force is always perpendicular to the velocity, um, and that is that since the work is the integral of the dot product between the force and the direction of motion, so here you can see that work has f dot dl, but remember that f is always going to be perpendicular to dl in this case. So if those two are perpendicular to each other, then that dot product is always going to be zero, and therefore the work is equal to zero. So magnetic fields alone do not do any work to a particle. They will change the direction of the rotation, but they will not cause the energy to change. Um, if you want the energy to change, that would have to be something else. It could be that the electric field would cause the energy to change uh, because it may or may not be perpendicular to the direction of motion. So we don't actually work very often with uh, free particles. So this, this first analysis has been for a free particle, but most typically, of course, we work with current carrying conductors or a wire. Uh, and so what happens when we have a wire? Well, the particles that are moving within that wire are still going to be subject to these forces, and they are going to uh, sort of tran transfer that force onto the conductor itself. So the question then becomes, what, what can we do to calculate the force on that conductor when there are a countless number of particles moving through it at any given time? Well, our friend Calculus is going to come to, the, come to our aid here. Uh, we know that F, so we had F, equals Q times V cross B. And we can then take a differential form of that to say DF is equal to DQ times V cross B, assuming that all the particles are going to move in the same direction, so they therefore have the same velocity, and assuming that the magnetic field is going to be constant, it's only the charge that becomes differential. 
So if we then replace dQ with rho sub v dv, remember that this is the, this is the volume charge density, so rho sub v times dv is going to give us dQ. So really didn't make very much of a change there for that equation. Now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, see that rho sub v multiplied by the velocity. So this, this pair right here, rho sub v multiplied by the velocity, actually gives the current density j. And then we're going to break the dv into a ds times dl. So if you think about it, we've got, we've got, a, we've got a, a current carrying conductor here, and I'm going to say that the end surface area is ds and that the length is dl. And if we multiply those two together, we would, of course, get the total volume of that, of that conductor. So dv equals ds times dl. Now, current density multiplied by surface area gives current. So if we take j and ds and pair them together, we end up with i. And we're going to need to keep the direction of that current because current itself doesn't have a direction. So we call it i times dl. Uh, and that, and then so the DL is going to come into this into this pairing as well, but it's going to it's going to pick up a directionality. So that directionality is going to tell us uh, which direction the current is going. That that directionality came from the current density, which you, which was of course a, a vector. So then we're just left with uh, I DL crossed with B. We could then take the, the integral of this to get the total magnetic force. Uh, we could just get uh, the integral of I DL crossed with B. Or what we're going to do is we're going to flip them. We're going to say it's B crossed I DL. But if you flip a cross product, you get a negative sign. So we have to introduce this negative sign. And that comes from the fact that A cross B is equal to negative B cross A. So when we, when we flip those, we ended up with a negative sign. And that's where that negative sign in equation 13.12 came from. You might say, why did we reverse them? Um, we'll see later on that there are some benefits to reversing it. To be honest, I'm not sure that those benefits outweigh the cost of having an extra negative sign, but this is the way that it's done, so that's the way that we're going to do it. Okay, here comes a, a, a really important question, one that, one that we'll have a specific answer to and a general answer to. The specific question is, what is the force on a wire carrying current I1 near a second parallel wire carrying current I2 in the same direction? And then the more general question is, do parallel wires with current flowing in the same direction attract or repel each other? You know what, I would rather, I, I've, I've done my calculation for what is the force on the current uh, I2 caused by the current I1. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call an audible here and change this. Uh, that will, I'll update that for your document so it should already have that change. So we're going to assume that these two uh, wires are a distance of R apart from each other. And I'm going to assume that this at least the, the right-hand wire has a length of L. It can be force per unit area, or force per unit length, so the L doesn't really matter, but it will end up in our, in our answer, so I want to go ahead and, and identify it. So remember that we already have Ampere's law, which says that uh, B dot DL is equal to uh, mu sub zero times the enclosed current. So if we draw a, 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 a circle around the first uh, wire, then we can see that we could calculate the, the magnetic field right at the second wire being caused by the first wire. And if I put my thumb in the direction of, so I'm going to put my thumb in the direction of the current, then my fingers are going to tend to wrap around in this direction. And therefore, we can see that that is the direction that the magnetic field is going to be flowing. And that means that right at the point where it intersects with the second wire, that arrow is pointing upward. And because that arrow is pointing upward, and we see over here our units, our uh, unit vectors, that's in the y, that's in the y direction. So the question is, what is the magnitude? I'm going to call this b sub two one, b on the second wire caused by the first wire. So b sub two one times two pi r, because that's the length of that circle that it has to follow. Um, is equal to mu sub zero times the enclosed current, and the enclosed current is just I1. So therefore, uh, B sub two one is equal to mu sub zero I1 divided by two pi r, and the direction is in the positive A sub y direction. So we've now calculated the, the magnetic flux density at the second wire being caused by the first wire. So let's now calculate the force on the second wire. So the force on the second wire is going to be equal to minus I on the second wire times the integral 
of B sub 2, 1 crossed with DL. Remember that DL is the direction in which the current is flowing. So we can actually see from, uh, from, the, from the, the picture that the current is flowing in the positive A sub Z direction. And we, and we know this is B sub 2, 1, so we can substitute that into there. So F sub 2 is equal to minus I2 times the integral of mu sub 0 I1 over 2 pi R times A sub Y crossed with A sub Z. And A sub Y crossed with A sub Z, if you look at that picture, put your hand in, put your fingers in the direction of Y, curl them in the direction of Z and stick your thumb out, it ends up in the A sub X direction. So this is A sub X, A sub X. So this is minus mu sub zero, I one, I two, divided by two pi R, A sub X, and this integral really with, the, and it's, it's gonna be an integral, I guess I forgot to put in the DZ. Uh, that integral in the Z direction is gonna, is gonna introduce an extra L. So we end up with mu sub zero I1 I2 over two pi R L times A sub X. You know what, I'm gonna reverse those so, so that the unit vector is at the end, L A sub X. That's the force on, 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 on line number two, on wire number two, caused by the magnetic flux density on wire number one. But let's look at the direction of that force. The direction of that force is in the negative A sub X direction. So the, the direction of that force is pulling the wire in this direction, which means that it's pulling that wire toward the first wire. If we were to repeat this analysis, we would find that this, the first wire is being pulled toward the second wire. So conductors, with the same current direction attract each other. So we have the specific answer, which is boxed, and then the more general answer, which is just good to know, is that two, two current carrying conductors that are parallel to each other and have current flowing in the same direction will tend to attract each other. We can now consider what happens if the two, um, if the two conductors, oh, this should be pointing in the opposite direction. So this, sorry about this, this should be pointing inward. So if they're pointing inward, then what is, the, what is going to be the force? Well, a few things are going to be identical. Um, because the, the current I1 is still pointing in, in the same direction, we know that we're still going to have the same current. Gosh, that's supposed to be a circle. We're still going to have the same current, and it's still going to be pointing in the upward direction right at the second wire. So we know that B sub 2, 1 is unchanged as mu sub 0, I1 divided by 2 pi R times A sub Y. And we know that F sub 2 is still going to be minus I2 times the integral, and I'll go ahead and define this integral to be from 0 up to L, of mu sub 0 I1 divided by 2 pi R A sub Y. But notice that now, because the current in the second wire is, is pointing in the opposite direction, this is crossed with negative a sub z dz. And a sub y crossed with a sub z still gives me a sub x, but this minus sign here and this minus sign here cancel each other out. And so therefore I'm left with uh, mu sub zero i1 i2 divided by two pi r, the integral gives me an l multiplied by a sub x. And that means that this wire is now being forced in the positive a sub x direction, which means that it is being repelled. So wires with opposite current direction repel, whoops, not repeal, they repel each other. So that's the, again, that's the specific answer and the general answer uh, for two wires with current flowing in opposite directions.
Now we're going to generalize our discussion of, of the forces by, you, by combining together the calculation of the magnetic field as well as the, as well as the force itself. And we'll do this in what's called Ampere's force law. Ampere was actually uh, prolific enough that he has many things named after him. Not only does he have the unit named after him, he has Ampere's law, Ampere's circuital law, and also Ampere's force law. So uh, we're going to see Ampere's force law here today, which first of all takes our knowledge that we've just found of the force on a current carrying conductor uh, due to a magnetic field, uh, and then it's going to combine it together with Bio Savart, which is the magnetic field caused by another current carrying conductor. And when we, when we combine these together by, by substituting B sub 1, 2 up into this equation, uh, and then we do a little bit of vector algebra, we end up with this expression, which is Ampere's force law. So Ampere's force law uh, allows us to do differential elements of both the, the, the conductor that causes the magnetic field as well as the conductor that is receiving the magnetic field, if you will. And so this is going to allow us to, to, to really be the most general of all equations. The problem is that it's actually also kind of a hassle to use because it's going to involve a double integral. Both of those integrals are shown as closed loops because it's difficult to have isolated current elements. But in practice, it does become quite challenging uh, for us to use this equation. Uh, so, so we tend to use it primarily when we're doing uh, computer simulations. Now let's briefly finish up today by talking about the force and the torque on a loop of current. We've been talking about uh, straight lines of current. We've been talking about a straight conductor, uh, but of course conductors can be curved and they can, they, can also, uh, they can also form loops and so forth. So I want you to consider this figure for a second. This figure shows a loop of current, so there's current that's going counterclockwise around this loop. Now, in practice, of course, somewhere there has to be a place where the current is being injected. Uh, so the current is being injected here and it's being removed here. Uh, and so in the middle here, there isn't a continuous loop, but we're going to assume that that is small enough that it's actually having very little impact on the result. So we'll just assume that there is a continuous loop of current here and that there is a magnetic field. And, and because it's the circle with the dot in the middle, that magnetic field is coming out of the page. So for each one of the elements of, of, the, of the loop, so it's, it's, I call it a loop even though it's a rectangle, we have a rectangle of, of current here that's in a magnetic field. And if we do the, uh, the analysis of the right-hand rule on each of the four sides, we're going, to find the, we're going to be able to find the direction of the force on each of those four sides. So let's do the force on the top. So I'm trying to squeeze this in so you can see both the, the picture and the equation at the same time. Uh, the force on the top is going to be I, uh, which is the current, multiplied by negative delta x times a sub x. So that's the, that's the direction of the current. It's flowing in the negative a sub x direction crossed with b times a sub z. So the, the current is flowing in this direction, which as you can see here is the negative a sub x direction, and the, current, and the magnetic field is flowing out of the page, which is in the a sub z direction. So that's where, that's where this comes from, and that's where this comes from. The length, of course, of the top is, is delta x, so we've got delta x as shown there. It turns out that when you do all of these calculations, you get um, uh, a sub x crossed with a sub z gives negative a sub y. That negative sign cancels with the negative sign that was already here. And we end up with i times b times delta x times a sub y, which means that the force on the top, as is shown in the picture, I guess there was a spoiler there, the force on the top element of this loop, in fact, is in the, is in the upward direction. And if we were to repeat this in, in each of the four sides, we would find that the forces are all pointing outward. If we reverse the direction of the current, all the forces would be pointing inward. But in either case, those four forces are going to cancel each other out. And we're going to find that there is no net force on a loop of current, which is a little bit disappointing. You might say, well, then why did you bother to go to all the trouble of having this discussion? Because there's one more thing here, and that is that the loop of current, while it has no net force, does have a net torque. Remember that force is like a push or pull, but torque is like a twist and turn. So now I'm going to, and, and now in the next figure, we're going to be looking at, at the top view. So whereas before we were looking at the side view, now we're sort of moving ourselves above and we're looking downward onto it. Um, and so, or maybe you could say we're looking at it from, from, the, from the rotated view. Uh, so what we find is that if we have uh, two current carrying conductors, we're going to ignore the ones that are in, in the delta y direction, but we have one current carrying conductor that, where the current is coming out of the page, and we have one current carrying conductor where it's going into the page. And if we do the same exact calculation that we did above, we find that the force due to the one coming out of the page is pointing upward, and the force on the one pointing into the page is pointing downward. 
And as you can imagine, that is going to tend to rotate or torque this, uh, this loop. It's going to torque it as long as, as long as we have free rotation that, that occurs at the axis, then the torque is going to rotate uh, such that the magnetic, uh, magnetic, di magnetic dipole moment is going to rotate to line up with the magnetic flux density B. So this, this angle theta right here is going, to, is going to be relevant for the calculation because the larger that angle is, the, the, the larger, the, I'm sorry, it, it's going to be, it's going to impact the, the, the amount of force. And we're going to find that as we approach M approaches B, the force is going to get smaller and smaller. So how can we calculate this torque? Torque, which uh, mechanical engineers use torque a lot, civil engineers use torque a lot. We don't tend to use it very much in, in electrical and computer engineering, but you're going to hear that a lot in this class. Uh, we know that the torque is equal to whatever the force is multiplied by what we'll call the moment arm, which is R, the distance from the force to the center of rotation, multiplied by the sine of the angle between the, the force and the moment arm. Well, in our case, then, that force is going to be uh, I times B times delta X in both cases for F1 and F2. One is pointing upward, one is pointing downward. <clears throat> and if we sum those two torques, then we have F times R times the sine of theta plus F times R times the sine of theta. You might say, why is that delta Y over 2? Because remember, if you come back here, and I'll erase a couple of these things, uh, what we want is the distance from the center of rotation out to the place where the force is being applied. And if delta Y is the length of that full distance, then delta Y over 2 is the length of half of that distance. So we end up with uh, this equation, which when we substitute F1 and F2 into that equation, we get this expression for, for the torque. So this is a complete uh, expression for the torque of a rectangular uh, coil or a rectangular loop of current in the presence of a magnetic field. <clears throat> but if we remember that the magnetic dipole moment, which we discussed in an earlier chapter, chapter 12, uh, that the magnetic dipole moment is the current multiplied by the surface area, well this right here is the surface area. So this is the area of a rectangular loop. Uh, we take out the current and we're left with B uh, and the sine of theta, but B times the magnetic dipole moment times the sine of theta, that's the cross product, M crossed with B. And so now we can, we can actually see a benefit of the magnetic dipole moment that we hadn't seen in the earlier discussion, and that is that if you want to know the torque on a loop, it is M crossed with B. So what is the, what is the magnitude of the torque on a 100 turn coil? That's an interesting addition. We haven't really seen a coil of wire with more than one loop before uh, in this class. Um, and we have two amps of current flowing through, uh, through it around a circle of radius 10 centimeters and a magnetic field of two Tesla if the angle is uh, 45 degrees. So we can see here that we're going to have a, a magnetic field. So the magnetic field is pointing in this direction, and that's going to be two Tesla. We're going to find that there is a, a loop of current. Let me, uh, let me draw this. And so then here is my loop of current. <clears throat> and this will be the magnetic dipole moment, and this will be B. And this angle right here is 45 degrees. Um, and we know that the surface area of that coil is, is a circle of radius 10 centimeters. Uh, although the analysis that we just did was for a rectangle, uh, equation 13.22, the torque equals M cross B, applies to any shape of coil. So tau, then, the magnitude of tau, is going to be I times B0 times the area times the sine of theta, which in this case is 100 times 2 amps. So effectively what I've done here is I've, I've said, oh, the current is 2 amps, but there are 100 copies of that current. So the effective current is 200 amps. It's multiplied by 2 Tesla, and then that's multiplied by the surface area, which is pi times 0 0.1 meters squared. 10 centimeters is 0 0.1 meters. And then that's multiplied by the sine of 45 degrees. And when we do all of these calculations, we end up with 8.88 and the units on torque are newton meters. So uh, you can imagine that if, uh, if this uh, force is going to cause the magnetic dipole moment to line up in the same direction as B, that like a, like a compass needle, the M will rotate until it faces in the same direction as B. 
But the problem is that that won't give us exactly what we want. What we exactly want is continuous rotation. We don't want it to go whoa, 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 and just get and settle down to a point in a particular direction. We want it to continuously be rotating to, to face a new direction at all times. And there are a couple of ways that we can handle that. One is to reverse the direction of the magnetic field. So we can, we can constantly be updating the direction of the magnetic field. Remember that that magnetic dipole moment is always going to be trying to chase the magnetic field. So if I have the magnetic field is pointing in this direction and M is pointing in this direction, so here's M and here's B, M is going to tend to rotate toward B. So now let's imagine that I can update M. So now M is pointing like this. And if we let it go, it's just going to eventually settle down on B. But what we want to do now is we want to, we want to figure out how to erase B. Come on, erase. Okay, well that one won't erase. Um, I'll, okay, it won't do that either. Okay, now I can erase B. But if I now update B so that it's pointing here, now M is going to continue to rotate toward B. So now I'll update M again. So M is now pointing here. But if we update B and point B in this direction, now M is going to continue to rotate. So what we, what we can do is we can either cause the magnetic field, the external magnetic field to constantly rotate or the magnetic dipole moment to constantly rotate. But in either case, we're going to find that, that we'll get continuous rotation. And there's an easy way to do that and there's a more challenging way. The easiest way to do that is to use an AC source. If you had alternating current, remember that the alternating current kind of naturally reverses direction all the time. And so if you used AC, you'd end up with what's called an AC motor. Uh, and an AC motor, there's lots of different types of them, but AC motors can, can uh, cause continuous rotation due to the changing direction of the AC current. But sometimes we don't have AC current. If we only have DC current, then we have to use what's called a commutator. So in that case, then the commutator is going to give us the opportunity to mechanically change the direction of the, of the, of the magnetic field. So what happens is that there is a, there's a, on the end of the rotor, there is a split here. And that split has two brushes that come in. So the brush, and it's not really a brush like you would think of like a, like a wire brush. It's really just a piece of carbon that comes in and touches it there. And it touches it on the opposite side. And it comes out like this. And you can see that if, 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 the, if the rotor rotates, then as the rotor rotates, every one, sort of twice every revolution, the direction of the current is going to reverse. Uh, and, and when the direction of the current reverses, then we're going to be sort of aiming for a new target. The target will shift by 180 degrees and we'll continue to track that target. And then it will shift and we'll track the new target, shift, track the new target. It will constantly be rotating. Now, it doesn't have to be that it only shifts every, every uh, twice every revolution. We could have a commutator that is broken up into smaller pieces. So then it would shift maybe uh, 12 times a revolution. You know, so maybe originally we're trying to track uh, one o'clock, but as soon as we get close to one o'clock, then it's going to shift to two o'clock, and it's going to shift to three o'clock, and then it's going to shift to four o'clock, and so forth. So the commutator gives us the opportunity to mechanically uh, change the direction of the current, and that will change the direction of the magnetic field, and that will that will uh, lead to a continuous rotation. So things that we've learned today: the magnetic force is Q times V cross B. That's probably the most important lesson to learn from today. We talked about the Lorentz force, which is a combination of electrical and, and uh, magnetic forces. We talked about gyro radius. We also saw the magnetic force on a current carrying conductor. We saw Ampere's force law, which allows us to calculate the force on any current caused by any other current. And then we saw that the net force on a current carrying loop is zero, but the torque can be found by either of these two equations.